Hello and welcome to English with Jesus, where we help you to speak English with confidence. You know, a lot of people are struggling with learning a language, and one of the biggest problems people face when they're learning a language is trying to remember words and phrases. And to be honest, anyone who has invested a lot of time and sometimes money in a language should be able to say, how are you, or I played football this week. And that brings me to our guest speaker, David James. David knows a lot about learning languages. In fact, he knows 20 languages. Let me go ahead and introduce him. Hi, David, it's good to have you with us. So why did you decide to learn so many languages? Some people are happy to speak one language. Why 20? You know, I never said to myself, hey, you, um, go and learn 20 languages, all right? So what happens is you learn a language and you think, oh, this is not so bad. This is interesting. I'm getting some dividends here in my, you know, self-image, and I'm able to um, to to do this. And people find it impressive, and I found it interesting. Um, uh, so when you were a kid, you start to do more. And you know, maybe my parents, you know, gave me some encouragement uh, along that way. They saw that I had maybe more aptitude towards it. So you know, I wanted to be. I don't, know, I don't want to do that. I wanted to be a you know, I wanted to be a marine biologist. I still want to be a marine biologist, but um, but the you know I probably didn't have as much aptitude towards that um, as uh, towards um, you know um, um, learning these languages. And of course, you know, at school you have the opportunity to learn uh, French, and clearly I was I was one of the things that I was clearly better than the other kids at, uh, whereas there were other things where I wasn't. And I, I kind of enjoyed being good at something you know um so um it, it kind of means that you then want to go on and do another thing and then another thing of the same sort yeah and and that's very dangerous what you should really do is think well look, hang on a second you should think um you know sh should i really necessarily be doing more and more and more languages and I, you know, i've come to the point where you know i don't want to do that many more you know, if I if I just do a, a couple more, then I'll be done. Yeah. So I'm, I just have to still do, you know, maybe look just like I've been saving up like for when I'm old and, and I just want to do something easy. Um, Brazilian Portuguese, because that's really quite simple in comparison with some of the ones I've done. On the meantime, though, I didn't I never really did Vietnamese because it has eight tones and we're surrounded by Vietnamese people. I'd really like to say more than just Xin Chou to them. So. You know, um, it would be nice to to know some Vietnamese and Korean's interesting because it's got that very interesting Hangul um, alphabet, you know, and it's supposed to be like Japanese from the point of view of grammatical structures. And that would be interesting to dip into, but not very much. And then, of course, I've done a bit of Hebrew, I've done a bit of, of, um, of Farsi, I've done a bit of Turkish. So, you know, these all take a lot of words from Arabic. So surely I should try a bit of Arabic. Um, and so you, you, you think all the time, no, stop learning, stop stop learning languages but always there's this temptation to do you know, just, just another little bit you know and so uh, what i've done now is i kind of make a mix for the last few years i've rationed out my learning time between languages and non-linguistic subjects so the method that i have we'll be talking about later on the goldless method i've been doing now for the last few years half of it's been language topics and half of it has been non-language topics. And um, I think it works equally well on both. But it was made specifically around the big memory task that you get when you have to um, learn a language. What is the biggest problem that people face in regards to learning a new language? Well, I mean, it, it's clearly got to be, it's got to be, I mean, objectively speaking, you hear a lot of different answers to that question. And usually when I'm listening to people say, oh, it's the grammar, leave the grammar aside, I'm kind of nodding my head, shaking my head, pardon me, because I'm saying, well, look, the grammar, um, even in a language like Czech, which has got a lot of grammar, yeah, it's really not more than about one sixth. Um, and, you, and the good thing about the, the goal list method is you can actually measure things like that while you're doing your goal list of what you actually need to do. You can cover even all of those different 
declensions of, of, of nouns, all the different kinds, you know, like salt, certain things like that, you know, we, we want more lined up, you know, and, and um, a bitty for that, that kind of, um, you know, like collective noun in the, in the neuter. Um, all of those things is, um, uh, uh, you can do the lot in, a, in about, well, probably, depending on how far you want to go, check, but, but that's going to be like maximum 2,000 um, lines of gold list, yeah? And then you might go on and do another 15,000, just putting your vocab and your phraseology together and still not really be able to read Kundara properly, yeah? Um, but you won't be not reading Kundara properly because you don't understand the grammar. You could take any sentence in Kundara and 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 just pass the grammar even if you didn't know the words you'd pass the grammar and when i say pass pass i don't mean pass as in pass the you know pass the the, the cigarette or whatever it is i mean parse as you would say parse yeah um so um it means basically break it down analyze the grammar so you could analyze the grammar and know exactly what how the words were hanging together um, which were the verbs and in which tense they were, which were the nouns and in which case they were. You could do that quite easily and still not understand the sentence because there'd be a key word in there that you, you hadn't happened to have learned so far. Yeah. So, you know, you, you, Hashik is probably a bit easier, but he's, he's a slightly old fashioned. So, you know, um, uh, it, when it comes to reading these, these authors, um, uh, so basically, uh, it's all down to the amount of the words, the vocabulary that you can that you can that you can know effectively, and then you can get into reading. Um, if you don't know enough words, even if you've covered all the grammar, you won't. You, you can pick up nes nesi tel na biti, and not understand much of it. Yeah, um, um, because you haven't learned all of those all of those words. Yeah, enough words to comfortably understand at least the context and then allow yourself maybe to um, to guess from context what some of them are, but that's a bad idea. I think much better is to always have the um, have a good translation when you, into your own language. If you're reading, for example, an English book, if you're if you're Czech and you want to read an English book, well, you know, most of them are translated into into the Czech language. Anything worth reading is already translated into um, into the Czech language. Um, and um, I'm not saying, you know, but some people, for example, like something reasonably simple to start off with. I've known people using Harry Potter. Some people may have an objection to, to reading Harry Potter, I don't know, because obviously we're in a Christian uh, society. Um, so I'm not saying read it if you, if you, if you don't like it, but, uh, but some people I know have read, have used the Harry Potter series. Um, and um, and, and, and they, because it's well translated usually into all these different languages, some of the translations of names are a bit imaginative, so they don't really, they don't really tally up. But I mean, you can quickly work out what this person, you know, you don't have to worry too much about that. You can gloss over it. And so you can, in a, in a sense, you can have the, the, the book open um, in, in, in English, and then you can have it open, op uh, open in, in, in your own language so that you can follow. And if you, you can read it paragraph by paragraph, and see what the missing words mean. You can note them on the margin in pencil and then transfer them to the gold list to be properly uh, learned, yeah? But this is, the, this is the thing, you know, you'll find that you, you get the same grammar structures coming up and by the time you've, you've read through, you know, I don't know, 30 pages, you've probably met every single grammar construction that the language has to offer, but you're still going to be meeting new words as you read on. And I'm talking about reading now because reading, in my opinion, is a very good practice. And I'm not I'm not alone in saying this. OK, um, the, the biggest person in our community that, that always says this is Steve Kaufman, who is kind of like on the same page as I am in a number of things, not entirely on everything. But um, but he's um, as, as far as reading is concerned, he would concur with me that that's a very useful thing. That's the first thing you want to try and do is become a good reader. And when I say reading, I'm, I'm including that audio book. So instead of having a, um, uh, a, a book, you know, um, a Harry Potter book, if, it, if that's what you choose, open in English, you know, so you've got two whacking great big fat books on your desk, you could be listening to it, yeah? And then and just have the Czech translation open on your desk. 
and listen to, uh, let's say, Stephen Fry is the person that not does the best reading. Um, his reading of the of, of it on, on Audible, um, and then you can um, you can follow it along. And if you say, if you hear a word that you don't know uh, that, that that Fry says, you know, and he's like, well, I don't know that word. You can then go and you can look it up in the text. Um, and this avoids doing this avoids the problem that some people who are splendid readers. I was in Sofia once in Bulgaria. Yes. Um, and I met a colleague who had read and read and read in English. She was uh, like a marvelous. Um, she it was lovely to talk to her because she'd read all sorts of things. Unfortunately, what she'd read a lot of was American literature. Sorry, I, I don't mean any insult to American literature. It's just we don't we don't learn as much of it in Britain, yeah. Because we, we, it, when you're going through school, they like you to concentrate first on your own style of English, so it doesn't get all mixed up. Um, and so we we don't usually do American literature at school. We do it at university. Um, so even as far as A level, when you're when you're 18 years of age, you're still not really doing you know Hemingway. Well, if you go to university, you'd almost certainly catch all that up, you know. Um, and uh, Her Herman Melville and all these big ones, you know, from from the other side of the Atlantic. I mean, we kind of gloss over the fact that Dickens did a lot of writing in America. He's still British, yeah. So, um, so, so he's included, but not, um, but not um, purely, you know, not Walt Whitman and all these, all of these purely American, fantastic um, uh, writers that you've got. Yeah, they tend to be left until somebody chooses that particular topic of English literature at university. Then they start to read them, or or they read them because they want to once they finish school. Um, but while we're at school, you know, we don't learn as many as many of them. So she had all of these things. I, mean, I could talk about J.D. Salinger, Catcher in the Rye, with her, and a few others. But I haven't read as much American um, literature as 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 English literature. So so that was the only thing. I, I think she was a little bit disappointed that I wasn't a Hemingway freak, uh, because she really was right. Um, and uh, but but I was amazed. But the, the problem was, she pronounced words. She spoke quite fluently, but she pronounced words. Well, basically the way they're written. So um, uh, so it, sure. it came out on things like saying vehicle, yeah, sure. things like that. Where you you unless you listen to 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 the audio book, you don't know it's vehicle, yeah. So the audiobook is definitely a better way to go. Um, I mean, I knew uh, another case. I was listening to a French guy, um, and he had clearly. I didn't get to know the guy as well, but he was he was at a technical conference as a speaker, and he'd clearly re read all of the technical literature about audit, which is which is my area, uh, financial audit. All of the technical history, he was clearly master of it in the English language, but because he'd never, and of course this, he has a difficulty because you you can't really find much about it actually as as an audio book. Perhaps I should think about some way of offering things like that on on audio, um, read out by native speakers. You know, a choice of um, this and your side of the Atlantic, so that people can listen to the technical literature actually in native language. Because this French guy, he was a French guy, or at least a French speaking, I can't remember, he might have been a Belgian, but um, he was a French speaking guy. Um, and his accent was so strong. You know, it was hard to believe how idiomatic and actually sophisticated his discussion involving technical topics was because everything that he had to say, you know, he would say that um, on this point, the standards are not quite cohérent. Uh, yeah, and 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 um, as uh, in order to actually follow him, I would have to repeat what he said in English. In in you know, you know, on this point, the standards are not quite coherent. And then when I and then I would listen to my version of what he was saying in his very strong French accent. Yeah. And then I think well, this is really good text, but you know, I had to really, I almost had to translate it, accent by ac from one accent to another, um, as I went. Now, of course, we don't have to do that so much for Americans because we kind of get used to Americans 
on on the TV. So you know, if if an American come comes along and and uh, and says something in a very strong Texas accent, I don't know whether I should do that. But uh, but you know, <laughs> so Ellen, you're a tramp and a drunk and an unfit mother. That's what my daddy said before he died. You know, um, I don't have to translate that into British English to understand it, right? That's J. R. Ewing from Dallas. Uh, but um, but but uh, basically. Um, I don't. I don't have to translate that into into British English to understand it, because we hear so much of that sort of thing, and it's it is a form of native English. So even if we listen to very strong South African accent like that, we don't really have to um, to translate translate it into uh, standard English in order to understand what the person's saying. If we if we are used to it, if we are used to talking to South Africans. Yeah. So that's an example. You could probably understand, that, but you probably know some South, South Africans who probably used to doing that that was really kind of like heavy cape town kind of like hefty kind of even not cape town perhaps more like pretoria strong you know um african that in, in influenced south african um very you know um i suppose different sure, to, to our way of speaking yeah but still we can understand it whereas you know you get someone who, who, who is speaking so strongly with a french accent it's, it's actually becomes, you know, they, they change so many of the phonemes that you can understand it, but only after you thought, what did he just say? Yeah. And when, and when you think about accent, that's the first thing uh, that you have to deal with when you start to learn a new language is to start to, um, to, to get a way of speaking, which is, which is like uh, similar enough to the uh, to the to, to the one which uh, which is used there, but it, but people shouldn't worry too much. People wouldn't shouldn't worry too much. People tend to worry a lot about that, and certainly it's more satisfying. The language journey is more satisfying if you can make a good imitation of the accent. It be becomes more satisfying, and people will think that you've done a much better job. Yeah. So the other day we were talking in in Czech, and I was doing my best impersonation of a Czech accent. And the next thing that I know is that Eric's suggesting I do the whole talk in Czech and I'm panicking, yeah? Um, because it's not as good as it sounds because I did look at the accent a bit. Um, and, and you might be forgiven for thinking it's better than it is because the accent's probably not too bad, yeah? Uh, because I spend time on it. Um, but if you can't get that, you know, uh, uh, and, and, you, and you're, uh, you're speaking, you know, like still with quite a strong native accent, then what's going to happen is the opposite. People are going to think you're not as good as you are, like I did with that. I kind of would have done if I hadn't been more accomplished in in, in sort of practical linguistics um, with that French guy, you know, I, because I could translate him into something intelligible in my head in real time. I could work out that he was really saying some sophisticated stuff and the words he was using and the grammar were all perfect, were perfect. If he'd have written it down, I'm sure it would have looked native. Yeah. But he sounded like he was come, you know, that, that he was he just come out of his first English lesson. So it's a pity for him, but it doesn't mean, I mean, he was still functioning. So it's a pity for him. But he, he was still functioning with his English at a top level, professionally, speaking at a world-class audit conference. So just if, if you're worried about your accent, don't be. But if you have got a good accent, if you have got the ability to impersonate other people's speech and bring in other sounds yeah and remember the czechs have got the hardest sound in, in the world it's in the Finnish guinness book of record yeah Dvořák is 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 you know the zh, 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 is is the hardest sound in the human tongue in that it's it's supposed to be harder than the african clicks uh, because um children as they're growing up can do their various you know and things like that but they learn the children in the czech republic learn to say the sound later than any other sound is learned by children in other languages so that that makes it the hardest uh, by by that token yeah um and so you've got the hardest um sound there's really no excuse for not learning a whole load of rather easier sounds. So if you if you if you have got an a tendency to impersonate other people's ways of speaking, you know, as the Japanese say, ways of speaking, 
then um, it, it's going to it's going to improve your language journey. Um, and I think you know there's something that if when you see a child um, taking the Mickey out of their teacher, you know when you know. Um, I just did a South African accent. Of course, I started doing South African accents because I had a South African that taught us literature, yeah, in 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 school, yeah. So uh, he was teaching us George Bernard Shaw, um, and uh, he said "man" at the end of of everything. So um, he, he he used to say to us, um, "Get out your arms and the man." Arms and the man is the name of a play by George Bernard Shaw, but he used to put "man" at the end of everything he said. So he said, "Where's your arms and the men, men?" Yeah, like that. <laughs> so we started to go, we, we started to repeat man at, several times at the end of every sentence. And that became a standard way of impersonating Mr. Podmore. But um, of course, he, he um, uh, we used to be merciless as children uh, in impersonating all of the teachers that had slightly different accents or anybody that came from a different part of the country. But what we didn't know, what I didn't know, is that I was picking up things that would be really useful for learning all sorts of languages from completely different parts of the world. But the accent is that right the first thing, and therefore what you should do when you start a new language, if you're starting a completely new language, is do audio only. So you're just listening. All you're doing is listening, like now. You're just listening to me, um, and I'm not letting you get a word in edgeways. But um, but that's what you need to do at the beginning, is listen to the language and then repeat. And then do those audio only things like Pimsler, um, Paul Noble, Mike Michelle Thomas, then innovative language. Learning. Those are the ones which were the, the four where you were uh, the four kinds of ones where you were mainly, you know, that's pretty much audio only. You need to do that at the beginning before you even put pen to paper. Sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm hogging the air, airwaves. So the basic uh, basic problem that a lot of people have is being able to speak with an accent that that is understandable by the the people they're trying to communicate with. So that's one of the the major major problems. And before you even get into a a gold list or writing the language, you have to nail the audio. Yeah, that, I call it I correct. call it audio front loading. I've I've written quite a few things about the gold list method on um, on my blog, which I think we're probably not mention necessarily so, here hooliganov.tv yeah hooliganov.tv um and if you go there you can see the goal list method uh, along the top bar there's a lot of different navigations on that but the one along the top bar where it says goal list method takes you into a series of of essays which is basically the skeleton for a book that i never seem to be able to finish writing um but it's it's a book effectively and in there it talks about the the this whole principle about about um audio front loading when you learn a new language and i don't put pen to paper there's a lot of languages which i'm still at the pimsleur level on you know i've never put i have i have put pen to, pen to paper in farsi but turned and done a bit of that um you know that the the uh the, the um nastalik i think it's called that's really old but the, the um the uh um the, the persian alphabet but in the main i'm still on pimsleur yeah so i can say much much more than i can write and later on i can um or and, and i can obviously understand um more than i can s remember to say because i'll probably be fishing around for the word um um or as when they say it, of course i remember it um and uh if, if i've listened to it enough times and again, you know, even the principles of the goalless method, like the, the, the space of time you give to let something sink in, let it go through the process of being naturally forgotten, and then reinvigorate your synapses by coming once something appears to be forgotten and doing it again after two weeks, after two weeks. Um, it doesn't really matter how long after, but the but then you've just got a question of if you don't do it soon enough after two weeks, you're just going to come to a standstill. Um, but but giving giving things two weeks so that you naturally forget what you're going to forget. I mean, I use that as well when I'm doing Pimsleur or other audio courses because I do the course and then I do another one from something else. And then after the two weeks has gone by, I come back and do it the second time. And of course, it's easier then. And it re and it reinvigorates old ones, you know. So I don't do it uh, eight times over because you can't you can't just leave out the things that you didn't see. But I do use a similar kind of um, you know th uh, conceptual framework which underpins the goalless method does work in a lot of other areas. And uh, you know it's something which is seems to be a key 
to making your life easier when it comes to dealing with the way you memorize things. Most people that think I'm barking up the wrong tree with the goal list method um, have been, you know, they, they, they kind of misunderstood it. And that's why that, that made me go ahead and write that much, much longer, much more detailed explanation, because the early one was a little bit abbreviated and certain things which I, I'm not really saying, it sounded like I was saying them. Okay, that, for that much, I have to take some responsibility. And of course, there have been some, ever since I started talking about it, it's a living method, um, it does move on a little bit, but it's not moving on much. I mean, the, the latest thing that I might have to say is that, you know, if, if, if when you're really, if you when you're going through and dis, distilling something, you discover that you want to add in more detail, especially on a non-linguistic use of the goalless method. So you end up with some distillations are bigger than the thing you distilled from. And basically that's fine, yeah, because it means that you, you started taking interest, that's automatically going to, um, to increase your ability to remember it anyway. Um, so, so I discovered that, for example, especially in agriculture, which is one of the topics I use it for, um, you know, I, I just take it pretty much from the book um, in the first run through. And then the second, I think, well, this is interesting. Let's get the Wikipedia article up. Then I find myself exp expanding my lines in, in the distillation that wasn't there in the head list. That's okay, new, so, yeah? So that's, so new, that's, an, being... example of, of, that's an example of how the, the goal list method develops as people use it. So it it doesn't just work for languages it also works for topics like agriculture or science or some other things it, it actually even works eric for things which are diagrammatical that's the wonderful thing a diagram uh, that can be drawn the first time and take 25 lines worth of room to draw it out because you put in all, in all that detail and take all that care you do a slightly more simplified diagram and this is for people that are you know, doing things like electric circuits, which I've done using goalless method. And you simply use more, you know, the tighter circuit symbols, you leave out the voltmeters and amateurs because you know roughly where they should go. Um, and, and just, just use the, the more key things you, you, you're focusing on. And you discover that you can draw an electrical circuit, the f which the first time took you 25 lines to draw, yeah, with that level of detail, uh, you know, that's in the book. The next time we draw it takes 17 lines so it just looks like because you because you focus on what's more important and then you focus just on what you didn't remember out of it or you draw it small because you 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 know that you don't have to, you can use abbreviations yeah uh, or you can draw the symbols smaller because you know what they are then you know what they look like and so if they're a little bit smaller and more cramped it doesn't really bother you so you can actually even even you can use the goal list method or something you, effectively that's the goal list method yeah and you can use it even for things which are which are an, an anatomical drawings um circuit symbol uh, circ um, circuit diagrams things like that diagrams yeah so it's even things like that and certainly discussions of things which you get out of textbooks for agriculture for physics um i'm doing mathematics as well in one um, and, uh, it, you know, it's it, it somehow or other, it always seems to work. It, I haven't yet found something to learn um, where the goal list method hasn't helped some, somewhere or another. And even it's quite useful for, uh, for time management. Can you explain a little bit more about the goal list method? Well, it works by having a lot, of, a lot of um, uh, seshiti, um, I think is the mm -hmm. word in, 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 uh, in Czech, yeah? So, okay. This is the one I just started. So normally I, I, I did it during a lesson because I do take lessons in a, you know, to, because my Polish is pretty close to native by now, yeah, in, in my Polish. So I have to take them, there aren't any books for me. I normally don't, I'm not a big Sorry to tell you this, but I'm not a big fan of, 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 of tuition. I prefer to use books. But here, this is from a lesson where I just took the notes and the teacher knows how I'm doing it. So he's used to me doing this. So, so there's the notes which, from what he told me. All, I do, all that happens is we talk. And when he notices something I say, which is different to the way native would talk, 
he tells me, so what you've got here is you've got the top left-hand side of a double page numbered from 1 to 25 in this case. You probably heard of a lady from, from Slovakia called Lydia um, Machola. Right. She uses 20. I think Lydia is one of the biggest supporters you have. She is, she's, yes. I mean, she, she, she's, 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 yeah. She is. I mean, obviously, she's got a slight, slightly different take, which is fine. Okay, I don't su suggest that my way, especially when you get into the details of how I use it, and I could go, I could get into a lot of details, so I use it a lot, um, has to be the same for everyone. There are some things where you, you really, if you're not doing it a certain way in certain respects, you're just not doing the goal list method, and therefore I'm not going to take any responsibility if it doesn't, um, if it goes wrong. In certain cases, you know, you could do everything right, um, everything com completely correctly, and there's one or two people that simply got themselves bored with it because they don't like that kind of thing. You know, they don't like that way of working, so they got bored with it, and so they started not finding, you know, fault or, or or really forgetting, even with the best will in the world. So, and then you know, you think to yourself, okay, so I'll give you, I'll give you, in your case, so you can, you can, I'll give you your money back, but that's quite easy because it's free, you see, so I don't actually have to give anything back. By the way, my um. My Black Friday offer of ninety five percent off is is still open if anybody wants it because it's free anyway. So I can be very very generous with my Black Friday offers. So um, uh, so it just I didn't do a whole twenty five, but normally went up because it was a lesson. But normally I would go down to twenty five. The next one goes from twenty six down to so the next page will go to twenty six down to to um, to fifty, and I haven't written that yet. Maybe I'll show you a different one. That one's uh, starting not so long ago. That's got that's got some Japanese. So every uh, this is already certain pages in, but it's already my I don't know nth book of this. So it starts at the top seven two five one. Um, so it's always going to start with with a multiple of twenty five plus one. Yeah. So it's going to be fifty one at the top, or twenty six, or seventy six, or zero one. Yeah is at the top of every every top left hand page in this case i haven't got that far in distilling it yet so there's nothing else there may i ask you a question yes yeah, so there's the date at the uh, top. for the audience they, they may not know sorry sorry the, the audience may not know what distilling is yet so when you yeah. when you distill what do, what do you yeah. do well when you first of all let me get to the end of what the headlist is because the headlist is that top right top left hand part that i've just showed you that's the headlist, and of course it's numbered. And as I showed you, it's numbered across books. So, um, and it can be numbered. I mean, my check one went into 24,000 lines, okay? So um, it, it's, it basically contains everything you want from your materials, so you don't have to keep going back to them. So you, you don't have to have that open. Because when you're, when you're distilling, you're gonna just have that book with you. You're not gonna wanna carry a whole bunch of other books with you. So, um, you uh, put everything you're going to need from the material uh, in into the headless, and you don't do it too tight. That was a bit too tight, what I showed you, so it wasn't a great example, but you don't want to do it too tight at the beginning, normally. Um, and then what happens is that's everything that you decided you want to learn. So you can put in anything that you already know or anything which you consider not worth learning, um, but you would definitely put in enough so that you don't have to go back to the book if it's a book that you're doing it from. Um, and, okay. um, you know, rather than just simply put in words from a dictionary, it's probably advantageous to use, um, you know, these uh, frequency dictionaries that have got sentences in, so you can put actually the whole sentence down. And I wouldn't be too worried about doing one word per line. I'd be more worried about making sure that everything was there, there that you really need to learn in order to get what you want out of that particular material. Um, and if there is a if there's a if there's a sentence or, or or a phrase with the word in it, that's definitely worth having. Unless there's an awful lot of stuff in there that is just writing out again words that you know, which is perhaps a waste of time. But some kind of way of putting words together is is usually better. But that can be done in distilling. So so that comes on to now we come on to distilling. You do that, and and you carry on doing it. But while, but once the, the ones which you've done, obviously you don't immediately then try. Some people would, some people say, okay, so you've got a vocabulary book. Basically, you've got a vocabulary book. 
and and some people have learned have, have been told by the teachers you should run a vocab book and quite right so you should so then they're saying okay so this is basically a vocab book so what makes it different what what makes it a special method so uh, in this case is the question that you wait for two weeks at least two weeks and there are reasons around that those two weeks um which I say come from Ebbinghaus, but they don't come directly from Ebbinghaus. They're in a, it's my approximation to the Ebbinghaus forgetting curve. So if you want to look at it, some people say, well, it's not in Ebbinghaus, but they haven't really got the fact that, uh, that it's an approximation to Ebbinghaus, because Ebbinghaus has a curve, whereas this is effectively a straight line going to the 14 days and then going flat afterwards. Yeah. So it, it basically is saying that Ebbinghaus shows us that by 14 days, yeah, pretty much there isn't that much left that you're going to forget between 14 days and 1400 days, which is of use to you in comparison with what you've already forgotten between zero days and 14 days. And therefore you can use that. And there's nothing magical about 14 in Ebbinghaus. Yeah, it is relatively arbitrary. Yeah, if we were on, if we were on uh, eight day weeks instead of seven day weeks, I might have said 16 days. Yeah, but heart, but there is more, maybe a bit more to it than that, because there is a cycle, the hunting cycle, which follows the moon, where, where ancient peoples had to uh, remember um, with their short term memories, um, basically tracks that they'd left so that they could go to where the mammoths and elephants that they, and big woolly rhinos that they like to hunt, yeah, um, where, they, where they were. Um, and then come back again, um, and and they and they could um, they could find their way back because they remembered they remembered the tracks that they left. They they'd agreed amongst each other, you know, where we place these white stones on this tree, uh, that's where we turn right, you know. But of course, they won't last very long. Those things. So so, but but they'd be hunting um, according to a lunar cycle because you need a full moon. You need a full moon in order to have an advantage over a big prey like a, like an elephant or a rhinoceros, something like that, that'll feed your whole village. And you know they're migratory animals. So you know that when we were that there is archaeological evidence that we used to we used to eat a lot of these things. Yeah. In fact, there's probably human beings that put mammoths extinct. And so um and so, you know, this is probably, you know, either I'm talking about if you if you're an evolutionist, I'm talking about obviously. Uh, millions of years ago, I don't believe those millions of years ago existed personally, but certainly around the time of Nimrod, who was the mighty, mighty hunter before the Lord, um, the, the things that he was catching, obviously he would have been using this this cycle as well, because it's the only time you've got that advantage over elephants, because they see better than you in the dark, yeah, um, uh, so, so you're not going to have an advantage coming up uh, to them in the dark, um, in, the, in the light they see as well as you, uh, the only time when you can see well enough, but they can't really see as well, is in full moonlight. And that's the time when you can set traps and drive them into it and they can't see what you're doing. Yeah. And throw you around and beat you up with their tusks. So that's why you had to be on that elephant. You know, you had to be on your elephants um, at, uh, at the full moon. So you had the time to get there, get to the full moon, get, get back again before the meat went off, obviously. Um, and so you had this, this, two-week hunting cycle which is one of the reasons why they say that there's a two weeks of female human fertility and two weeks of female human infertility it's all linked into the same thing because you they didn't want to have their ladies you know so when you have these ancient tribes where uh, where women live close together and all start I'm sorry to say this in, in, in a Christian uh, environment, but all start having their flowers um, at the same time. That also tends to be at a particular time with regard to the lunar month. Okay, that's observable yeah, in anthropology. And this all links in with the short term memory. And because it's for being able to follow your track, you don't need to remember that you know, the, the plant-based things where, oh, at, the, at this tree we turn right. Well, you don't need to learn that so that you remember it three years later because the tree is going to look different three years later. 
three, two weeks later, it's not going to look that much different, but, th but three years later, it will do. So this is the cutoff between short-term memory and long-term memory based in that hunting cycle, which has really been the key to understanding a lot of features of humanity, whether you say it's on an evolutionary basis or on a created basis, doesn't matter. It's still the same. Yeah, you can you can explain the same phenomenon, both from a deeply Christian perspective and from an evolutionary perspective. This is based on observation of well, observable ob observable phenomena. So um, you know, uh, since we're all you know here, it's English with Jesus, and uh, and and we, 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 we you know either we're we're Christians or we're seeking to to to, to know the truth. Um, or just interested generally in, in a religious perspective, the Goldless method doesn't uh, depend on evolutionary biology, yeah? but it certainly can be explained by either creationists or in evolution, like many things. It can, be, it can be equally well explained by two different approaches. So it's not just for Christians, it's not just for evolutionists, but certainly um, it's an interesting fact that uh, these things exist in the human race, um, and, um, and 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 I think the goalless method also feeds into that 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 two weeks and is not the only thing about human beings. There are certain healing cycles, certain fasting cycles, which also um, have uh, have a two week length um, in the body. So there are a number of things. There are a number of things that that, that uh, humans have which which have that that period. And so really, if you're picking a time, you know, two weeks, there's a reason for it. Yeah. So you don't look at uh, during those two weeks. You don't look at the, 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 what you wrote. You don't try and 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 push it into your mind. You don't cram it. You don't cram it over and over and over again because this is an activity which is echoing what those hunters were doing on their way to the elephant, cramming. You know, and they were going along, going yes. When the white stones are on the, the are on that brown stone we go right and they're, they're kind of pushing this into their head and maybe they even turn it into a little song and repeat it a dozen times a day just to or make a kind of longer song where they where all of the different uh, um uh directions that they put down they can remember them all going back again but they the next time they go out they don't want to remember that because they're going somewhere else the elephants have moved on yeah so that so the, the short-term memory will disappear and if you push things into short-term memory you're basically setting yourself up to fail in language learning cramming for an exam gets you through an exam people who cram for exams don't tend to remember for the rest of their lives what they learned for their exams so they they, they come they get brilliant certificates showing how much they know um, and then you ask them even a year later well okay so what what's you know say they, they crammed at law school and became lawyers great with with very good they got first first class degrees in law because they knew all of these cases because they they were up in the library until midnight cramming them day after day and you, you go back a year later and say okay so so what does it mean if i'm not liable under henley headley burn versus heller well, yeah i remember that there was a case that well i can't remember what the details were though yeah and so because they crammed it and afterwards even if they might need it they don't they don't remember it yeah uh, they don't remember the, the case details. So, so a better way of studying is to put down what you want to learn. And law, law cases, incidentally, can be, uh, they're great. Case, case law is a great thing to do. Um, um, Goldless method on if, if anyone's studying law. Um, you, you put all, the, you, you put all the, the, the facts of the case in, you know, the, 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 what the verdict was, what the facts of the case, what the verdict was, what its precedent for, what the obitus dictum was, who judged it, what it was, what court it was judged in, and the date, of course. And, you, and then you can start to distill the details down to the most salient points over the course of a number of iterations each time you wait for two weeks. And so what happens is you come back to it, you've forgotten what you were going to forget, and you remind yourself by writing out again and then you write it out again on that top right hand side so you had everything on the top left hand sides and then when you write it out again it's going to be on that top right hand side so maybe i'll show you an example of that there's a, another book just take the first best here's an example and if you can see it you've got top left mm -hmm. there's got 25 yeah top right 
in this case, much fewer. I didn't just manage to distill much down here. Maybe I even added something. And then I distilled it again down there. So that when you finally get down there, it's much, much less than it was at the beginning at the top there. Much, much less than it was at the beginning at the top there. Mm -hmm. And that's each case is called distilling because you're getting down to the... Each case is called distilling because you're getting down to the... I'm getting a bit of echo. Okay. Well, um, basically what it means is every time you get it, it's going smaller and smaller. So you're getting down to less to cover every time you go through it. Until... Well, the first time you've got that bronze book, yeah? And the first book is called the bronze level book. When you got to that fourth point, the bottom left hand, as you're going around in a circle using the four quadrants of the book, like I showed you. Then you, you, you take the silver level book and maybe three, four or five or even six of the first um, bottom right, that's called distillation number three or D3 because you've done it three times. And each time you did it, you waited two weeks. Okay. Then you take it to the silver book and you, and, and you do 25 again, but that's from the, that's from um, headlist having been distilled already the fourth time. Headlist that maybe was, was um, four or five or six or seven pages. So maybe you had a hundred words in the headless that now are 25 in your in the in the d4 which is the top left hand side of your silver list okay you might have to listen to that explanation a few times if you're hearing it for the first time and uh, the thing about distilling when you do it is obviously you're looking um at what you wrote two weeks ago and you're thinking well what of this can i do i know that i've remembered because i've been using it thinking about it even after those two weeks have gone um and that you can basically leave out. Um, uh, so you would perhaps put a little cross. I use a, a symbol like a cross um, in a um, in a circle, or like an X in a circle, to show that I'm I'm if I'm planning a distillation. I don't always plan them. I off, these days I'm more often than not not planning them, just doing them. But if you plan a distillation, which is good a good practice if you're a beginner, um, then you put you put a mark whatever you want to put. Um, near the ones that you want to kick out and you put and brackets by things that you want to combine because even after you've kicked them out maybe you go through and you think well I can't really feel that I've completely learned to my point where I'm comfortable that I really will not know it and will know it forever this particular point anything you think you know forever you know um, and remember we're going for a passive understanding we're not even if you couldn't remember so let's say you want to do this business where they cover it up you don't cover up the side uh, where you go into the language you've got the language there and you'd cover up if, if you cover up anything you'd cover up your own language so you're remembering from that language as if you you were asking well if i come across this in a text reading it would i understand it because as long as you've got that you can activate it later so we're going for passive knowledge so that when somebody presents you with that word or that point will you remember it then not do, do i remember what the word for blue is in persian yeah RB, by the way, RB is the word, but um, but the um, uh, but do, will I remember that RB when I when I come across it means blue, yeah. Um, so um, uh, and and if so, you know, range RB the blue color, yeah. So 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 if I remember this, yeah, then that's fine. I don't have to worry about the fact that when I thought about oh I want a I want um I want a a, a blue bracelet that's banderange rb you know i couldn't say it very fluently that's not a problem because you need passive learning and then by listening or immersion especially immersion you'll activate it and that's for sure yeah and this is so if i if i try and carry on here yeah? so basically when you're distilling you're trying to get it down to perhaps 60 perhaps 70 percent um, of what you had in the previous version so you can tell that every time it's going to be a bit smaller um, the one that I showed you, the example I showed you just now, didn't do that in, in D2, which is the second one, the bottom left, because I probably added in, I probably got interested in it um, and added in some facts, because, you know, th this one here is, is for non-language, non and I usually find that I um, hit on a topic where I think, well, that's interesting, let me grab the Wikipedia article, and then I always want to add a few more notes as I go through. That only really happens to me on um, on the non-language side. So sometimes I actually get distillations; they get bigger rather than smaller. But then it comes out in the wash the next time, you know. And so finally, when you've taken it through, 
um, those levels so that you've distilled something seven times and written it once on a headlist. You're at the end of the silver book and then you can go to the gold book. I usually wait at that point. And then when I've done the whole project, then I put it into the gold book because otherwise, you know, it's just too much levels of it. Yeah, so, so basically then I go through and, uh, and, um, and show, um, you know, I, I, got, I, I want to show you something. Um, let, me, let me try and, can I try and share you something on the screen. So then since 2010, I've been doing it every year. And in 2010 alone, I had more, at least on these projects, than I did all, all those times before. And you can see that each particular, oh, that's not quite true because that's, that's a cumulative total. So in these are the actual year's totals. I had 13,000 in that year. I had um, 9,000 in that year, 9,000 in that year. 13,000 was a particularly good year, 2013. But the record year was 2014. I did 17,000 that particular year and broke my records then. Then in 2015, I did 14,888. And here you can see the total of 2016 is the next record broken with 18,938. That's uh, lines per year, that's lines. Um, and then that became the, the, the record after that 2017 was 24,000 lines that year. And I think the, the overall, the biggest one that I've ever done was last year was 2020. And that I got actually as far as 28,000 lines in that particular year, because doing so many things, including non-language as well as language, means I've got an impetus to really spend a lot of time on it um, and do lots of different things in it. Um, and I got up to that, that particular year. So like that's the equivalent, because it's an efficient way of study, most of these years would be the same as like what you'd do as a full-time student if you didn't have a good method. So it's like you're, you're earning yourself a degree, um, then, um, you know, it, it really is the most effective way to do it. Um, there are ways which, which, you know, try to approximate. I mean, there's a guy called Vozniak, and he did, he, he, his method is, is what's underneath something called Super Memo, and there's also underneath something called Anki. And these are programs based as well on Ebbinghaus and the forgetting. But they basically, they, they, they go like... In a sense, they look at the, the situation from over the line of the graph, whereas I'm going from under the line of the graph or vice versa. But basically, because of my approximation, I'm, on, I'm doing less work and coming to the same result. But it takes longer to do it in terms of how many years you're involved in it. But the actual number of minutes you spend is lower. Yeah? Because in order to get to that maximum remembering, they they prompt you, you know, so so that they prompting about 10 times to get to something which Ebbinghaus proves you really only need to be prompted three times to remember if you put the intervals in and they don't give you long enough intervals. So that's why, the, the you know, you could say that in theory, I mean, it takes longer to write something than it does just simply to, to uh, click on a flashcard. Um, but really, if you didn't bear that in mind, you'd say that this was three times faster, but you have to bear that everything in mind. And so I think really you can say it's about one and a half times faster than even other good methods. That's what I believe, yeah? So, um, you know, it means effectively, whether, whether it's always going to be free or not, I don't know. I might have to, but, but there, was a, there was a few years ago when I... Was I had my back to the wall? I was thinking about well, maybe I can't afford to to give it away anymore. But thankfully, that that went away. God saved me from that situation at the last moment. That's a different a, a story for a different day, maybe. But uh, but basically, um, because you know, I don't get a penny more if everyone today decides they want to do this, um, and they they're very successful and it goes around the world you know i don't get a penny more from anybody for this okay if people would like to give something uh, for this evening's work well you, you've probably told them the donation which they can give yeah to gideon's to the printing of bibles if you want to give a donation that's completely voluntary if nobody gives anything so it's it's still as far as i'm concerned it's the same as between you and the lord yeah but um but uh, i don't get anything so i'm not Know, talking this up in order to you know it's not a trade talk it's not a, sa a sale 
of a method because, you know, uh, it's not going to make me rich. It's not supposed to make me rich. But if it works for, for you and, and for quite a lot of people, there's, there's people out there who have used it a lot. And obviously there's, there's, there's Lydia, there's uh, Victor, there's a whole bunch of people. Um, they don't always come to, to uh, in, in public every five minutes and say, oh, yeah, I'm still using it. It's still fantastic. There are also people that have gone off it. Of course, it's not going to be to everybody's taste. Uh, there are people that, that think it's nuts, but they may, in the main, they don't really understand it, as I said above. Um, there are those who, who even have, uh, have criticisms um, online just simply to raise up some kind of controversy to get hits. Um, that's one person I can think of who lives in Wrocław, but um, he's been told very clearly and he had the decency to leave the explanation there that basically proves to the world, if they care to read that far, that everything is said is you know, not relevant because it's not really addressing what the goalless method is. Um, but he kind of left it there just for hits, I think. Um, and, well, I kind of get it. Although, I, yeah, really, I wish that people would represent the method properly. That's what I wish they would do. So, and, and you know, and, and not put people off because some people did get put off. And it would have been a pity because it's there to be used and it's there to give use to people. Um, and it has been responsible for people learning languages that failed with other methods. So, you know. Anyway, next question. So, you know. Would you like to give a challenge to our audience? What would you suggest to those who try this method? I mean, give it a try. I mean, uh, it would be helpful if you read that whole thing I referred to, because they'll give you, a, there's a lot of it. You might think, well, there's a lot of this. And uh, why should I give enough time um, or, or a lot of time? It'll take me hours to study the whole thing. Um, but it will save you many more hours than you could possibly spend learning it. You know, it will save you that. And it will also save you money because it will help you. It will help you um, be more independent in your learning. So you'll get more learning time unguided. I'm not saying that, you know, I'm not trying to, 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 to reduce your dependence on um, on on Eric's lessons, but but you'll get even more from Eric's lessons if, in the meantime, between lessons, you can do more effective self study anyway, right? So um, you know, uh, and a good teacher is always happy for the for, to see success on the part of the students, and uh, so uh, you know that's why you know some language teachers are against it because they think, oh no. If I give the people this, you know, they won't need me anymore. But then the good ones, Eric and Lydia, people like that, they 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 share it, you know. And um, you know, uh, the the guy I can't say his name really because he was very shy about it. But the guy in Moscow uh, that I uh, gave the um, the lecture as well, he was another one that uh, he was a teacher, but he wanted his students to 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 use the method. So um, so my my challenge to you is, you know, read 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 what's well, I've written about it in hooliganov.tv and give it a good try. Give it a give it a try, you know. Um, there are Facebook groups. There is a Facebook group for the Goal List Method uh, user group, and you can go there and you can ask questions if you want, if you get lost on the way. Um, but, you know, give it a try. See if it's for you. Um, and, um, yeah, that's the challenge. There you have it, folks. So go ahead. Uh, start using your gold list today. I have mine here and I'm using it myself. And if you're interested in trying this method in a group setting or private lessons, then you can go to www.englishwithjesus.com and we'll be happy to help you start using this method. We can help you along, coach you along in the process so that you can stop forgetting and start speaking English with confidence. So until next time, goodbye.